recently the Lord laid a message on my heart that I had thought maybe would be out of the um, series on faith, but I think we'll put it in that series, though it will uh, sort of be an interruption in this part that we've been studying on enemies to our faith, and it concerns prayer. It's based on Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 18. And it's going to probably concern a lot of things, but I guess what I wanted to... Uh, I think that it'll probably end up tying into our series on faith, but I think what I'd like to do is is remind us of some of the uh, the things we've been studying and experiencing in this church recently so that there's one particular context for this uh, message tonight. And what's on the top of my mind um, were the studies we did a short time ago concerning gossip in the church concerning gossip. You know, it's a real freedom to have your mind uh, clear from all of that garbage. Jesus said it's only the pure in heart who will see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, not the false accusers or the gossips. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And only the pure in heart will see God. And maybe one of the greatest manifestations we have of a lack of self ishness or self-centeredness in our life is when we spend our time praying for other people. And I don't think we'd ever spend time praying for other people, praying for the saints, not the world out there, if we had that um, critical gossiping type spirit that, that so many people do have as a great danger that we just don't want to have in our midst because our Lord doesn't want us to have that at all. I don't really see how we can be after the spirit of unity, which is the Holy Spirit in our midst, and how we can be after the highest commandment, which is love, love toward God and love toward our brother in Jesus, if we have this spirit of criticism or this spirit of negativism toward one another, the spirit of gossip. I don't assume that we have it anymore. I don't detect it or suspect it. but. I want to put this message at least partially in that context. If we are people who are after love, who really want to know what love is and experience love because God is love and our faith works by love and love is the greatest commandment and so we want to love one another uh, because all men will know that we're his disciples. I mean all of the benefits uh, that we have if we have love in our life, I don't think that we will ever attain that goal of pure love of a love that God requires of us if we have this spirit of criticism and gossip. So I just want to remind us, because we <clears throat> have so many teachings in this church and we hear so many things that you know, you're hardly finished with one topic and just boom, you're on to another one. Amen. And so your mind is just um, continually going on to the next thing. And we need to sometimes be reminded. Uh, sometimes that's my role and sometimes that's your role as an exhorter or uh, whatever in the body, and it's all the time the Holy Spirit's role to call these things to our remembrance Amen. and to remind us of these things. Um, and just the weighty type things, um, the very important things that we've been studying. Uh, going back on the subject of weight, which is now um, not W-A-I-T, the other type, which is several months ago now. Don't forget that. We, we can't teach on that every week or every month. Don't forget that. God wants us to be a good testimony in that area. That's been several months ago. If you're overweight, you need to be losing weight. The pounds need to be coming off. That's just to put it real bluntly and realistically, but don't forget that. Maybe even more important than that, because it just goes into so many different areas, is the subject of gossip. I don't detect it or suspect it or anything. And so maybe if you don't have it, then maybe you need to reflect on that that what a pure state a Christian can exist in when he has no evil thought Amen. against his brother or his neighbor, Amen. that he refuses to harbor those thoughts. He will not allow them to enter his mind. He will not dwell on the negative or the evil or that which is a, a bad report. He will not dwell on that. He will not say that. He does not talk about people when they are not around to defend themselves. He does not say that. I hope you're experiencing that in your marriage and in your family now, Amen. that there are no evil thoughts and there are no evil discussions. Well, if we're experiencing that, uh, then, then we're in, uh, in store for some real blessings. We're getting more in line with God's Word then. Wow. We're obeying Him here. 
that you see someone do something and well you just say praise the lord i'm going to pray for them i love them i don't think evil i don't know what their thoughts were their intentions i don't care to know praise god i'm going to love them anyway i'm not going to entertain the evil i'm not going to dwell on that or think about that well let's come to something else in tonight with that kind of as a background and a context and that considers praying with all prayer and supplication in the spirit for all the saints ephesians 6 and verse 18 ephesians 6 and verse 18 and you'll see how it ties into the message of faith as well well after paul starts in in verse 10 to this little discussion on spiritual warfare spiritual weapons and he's saying you know what we have to do that we've got to put on god's armor and then he begins to detail various parts or aspects um, items of that armor that each of us must stand verse 14 with our loins girt about with truth and that each of us must have on the breastplate of righteousness and that each of us must have our feet shod for evangelism the preparation of the gospel of peace that each of us must take the shield of faith you know you can't really take the shield of faith for someone else you take your own shield of faith you're certainly not depending on someone else's faith we each must take the helmet of salvation the sword of the spirit well you know after he goes through all of those things that we must each do for ourselves, it's interesting that he ends on verse 18 and we must each do this thing for everyone else i mean you can't take someone else's shoes on i mean you could borrow their shoes you can't wear their shoes for them you can't wear their helmet their sword their shield uh, their clothes you couldn't do that for them all these various aspects which are pieces to the christian's armor you do that for yourself you can't do that for someone else you can pick up a shield and maybe they can get behind you but you can't hold their shield for them you're holding your own you can't wear their helmet for them each aspect is something you do on your own and for yourself and then the interesting thing is the twist in verse 18 praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication and i guess if we were just following in line with everything else he had said thus far for yourself i mean pray for yourself pray for yourself so that the devil doesn't overcome you and pray for yourself so um that you won't enter a serious temptation and fall in that pray for you. he doesn't say that it's for all the saints everything else was do for yourself take the shield of faith and take the uh belt to the girdle of truth and the breastplate of righteousness and then pray always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints for all the saints well let me make a few comments about this verse uh, it's certainly talking about consistency in prayer the prayer Paul speaks of elsewhere as prayer without ceasing prayer and supplication watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication you know when you read it in the King James Version or really when you read it in any Bible it kind of seems to be a compound verse uh, with a lot of uh, ambiguities or generalities or kind of some vague notions in it praying always with all prayer and supplication and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication you probably got it memorized but what all those words mean well i think one thing that's a real, real blessing to me to understand from this is paul's not trying to be technical when it comes to prayer i mean how can you be technical you either pray or you don't pray when he says praying always with all prayer and supplication some people would like now what are the differences between praying with all prayer and praying with all supplication well, I think that's the whole point. Paul's saying, just pray all different types of prayers, all different kinds of prayers. You know how in your own life, you don't sit down and say, now, what type of prayer is this I'm praying? There may be name tags. I'm not denying that. But as you're led, you just pray. And sometimes you're happy. And sometimes you're sad. And sometimes you're burdened. And sometimes you feel victorious when you're praying for someone else. Sometimes you feel like you're entering into what they're experiencing. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes it's kind of cold and formal and dry, but it's in faith. And sometimes it's in faith, but it's with a lot of enthusiasm and emotion and experience. So what Paul is saying is, because a lot of people, if they don't have that type I just described, will either not pray 
they never start. Or if they do, they'll think my prayers are ineffective because I don't have what I had the other day. Paul says pray with all types of prayer and all types of supplications. In other words, all kinds of prayers. Sometimes you're going to have enthusiasm. Sometimes you're going to have a burden. Uh, sometimes you won't. I wouldn't call it mechanical or rote. I would call it being obedient. Some people call being mechanical, being obedient, or really being obedient, being mechanical. It doesn't have to be because it isn't. Paul says to pray for all the saints with all kinds of prayers and supplications for all of the saints. Uh, so you don't feel like it. Be obedient and pray anyway. Amen. So you do. Be obedient and pray anyway. Amen. If you do feel like it, don't pray because you do, because then if you don't, you won't pray because you don't feel like it. Pray because God says to pray. Pray because this is part of the Christians, and now we've gone beyond the Christian as singular person, Ephesians 6, verses 10 to 17, but the body of Christ, the church of Jesus Christ, this is part of their spiritual warfare. God has put us here not only to take care of ourselves, but to take care of one another. I mean, take the hu natural example of the human body. Does the hand just fend for itself, or doesn't it also groom the body and co comb the hair and wash the legs and feed the mouth and tie the shoes, and the hand takes care of the body? It takes care of himself. When he gets hot in a fire, he draws his hand away. He takes care of hand. Hand takes care of hand. Hand takes care of the rest of the body as well. Feet don't just carry feet. You ever seen two feet walking? No, there's something on top of them, carrying the whole body. The body takes care of the body. Each member takes part, not only takes care, not only of itself, but of the whole body of which it is a part. So God has put us here to take care of one another. We take care of one another in a whole lot of ways, but I guess the best way, the most accurate and efficient and scriptural way is we take care of one another through prayer praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit for all of the saints for all of the saints now i guess it's especially on my mind because just a few days ago when i just i had a burden and an enthusiasm and a zeal and a love to pray for somebody in the church that someone that had just confessed the need that they had to the whole body uh, n not really a need i mean they were confessing victory but i thought well you know, how, how prone sometimes we are whenever we hear someone confessing victory. Well, to write them off, they're taking care of themselves. Let me find someone who doesn't, have, who, who doesn't have the victory, but who does have a problem, and I'll pray for them. But hey, those who have problems but have the victories over them, um, they need our prayers as well. And it's not something that you just talk about or think about. It's something that you do. It's something that you experience. And you don't know... You don't know what self-giving is and self-sacrificial love is. You don't, and that's what I mean here, love. You don't know what that type of love is until you've had the privilege and we're supposed to be doing it for all the saints at all times of praying for your brother in the Lord, for your sister in the Lord because of the needs that they have or the desires that they have or because of the blessings that they have. You can rejoice with them. You can thank God with them in your prayers for their blessings. God's going to bless you as a result of that. You're going to somehow enter into their blessings as a result of that. So with all types of prayers and all types of supplications, don't let the devil try to put in your mind that you've got to say a certain thing or, well, now how do I begin this? Or He tells us in essence how to do it is pray in the Spirit so your mind doesn't have to get into... What should I say or how should I say it? Or what should I be praying about? Pray in the Spirit. With all types of prayers and supplications, with all types of, of atmospheres or modes that you find, or moods rather that you find yourself in, with all types of moods that you find yourself in, pray for them anyway. Prayer in the Spirit is a very, very effective weapon against the devil. Uh, it's a mystery. We're told by Paul in 1 Corinthians 14, when we pray or speak in the Spirit, we pray and speak mysteries to God. I mean, it's a known language. Why God has chosen this, I don't have the answers for that, but I know it's effective against oh, Satan. Yeah. 
It's often more effective, even though it's simply Amen. praying in some language, it's more effective than praying in the language that you know Amen. by natural birth. It's still a language, Portuguese, it belongs to someone. And so you're praying in that? Well, you're praying, let's say you're praying in Portuguese, you're praying in that, which you don't know. Praying in it supernaturally, I would say is more effective for the most part Amen. than a person in Portugal praying in that, who knows that on, their own language. Or why, we could ask, would God ever have chosen this method, this avenue, yeah. the baptism in the Spirit and praying in tongues, oh, praying in the Spirit. Hallelujah. It's very effective. Oh, no. It may be a known language that someone around you recognizes, but it's a very effective way. Why? I don't have all the answers. I just know that it is. I don't get my mind into it. I think that's one of the reasons behind it, so we don't get our mind Amen. into it. Amen. You don't have to think. You don't have to analyze. You just have to do. Amen. Do it in faith, but just do. Just exercise it. Amen. Now that he's talking about praying as we know it in the Spirit, which means in tongues, turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Because, you know, some people think that when they come across Ephesians six 18, they've got a verse for being spiritual in prayer. Well, I don't think you should be in any other state when you're praying, but be spiritual. And I don't think you should be in any other state any time of the 24 hours of your day if you're a believer. So I don't think Paul is saying, now, listen, when you pray, it doesn't matter how you are the rest of the day, but when you pray, be spiritual. You want to be carnal? Do it the rest of the day. Well, I don't think that's the Apostle Paul's reason or argument here. I don't think that's what he's after. Praying in the Spirit doesn't mean to be spiritual or pray spiritually. Well, all prayers, if they're prayers, true prayers, they are, they are spiritual prayers. By virtue of the fact you're praying them, you at least have some spirituality to you. Praying in the Spirit, in the Spirit, it could either be a capital or a small s because it's, it's both ways. It's your Spirit praying with the aid of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, in a supernatural foreign language. That's what Paul means to do. So that that is true is seen in 1 Corinthians 14. He that speaketh, I'm in verse 2, in a tongue. Now here he calls it speaking in tongues. We're going to see that he identifies praying in or with the Spirit with speaking in tongues. The Apostle Paul who wrote Ephesians 6, 18 is his own best interpreter. And he interprets that over in 1 Corinthians 14. He that speaketh in a tongue speaketh not unto men, now he can be speaking about men, but not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. Now, spirit, anywhere in the Greek, it's going to be the same case. I mean, you, that's up to you as a translator, an interpreter, to know whether it's a capital or small s is spirit. And so many places like um, those relating to prayer, it can be, and probably is, both. It can be either, and is both. Howbeit in the Spirit, he speaks mysteries. Because the same apostle who wrote Ephesians 6, 18, who wrote 1 Corinthians 14, 2, and some other verses here, also wrote Romans chapter 8, verses 26 and 27. And there he specifically identifies these groanings and utterings that are made as coming from the Spirit, capital S, the Holy Spirit. So in verse 2, how be it in the Spirit? Well, it, through or in the Holy Spirit, he speaketh mysteries. Through or in or by or out of your own spirit, your own, that, that spiritual part of you versus your intellect, he speaketh mysteries. All right, so he's talking about speaking in tongues, and he calls it in the Spirit. Now, maybe an unlearned person would say, well, here in 1 Corinthians 14, 2, spirit small s, and over there in Ephesians 6, it's capital. Well, that probably proved just the reverse of what you'd hope that it would prove, because if he's talking in Ephesians 6, 18 about praying spiritually, it'd be a small s there. Praying in the spirit would be small s. In, in the spirit, capital S would have some reference to the Holy Spirit. Well, let the Holy Spirit uh, guide your prayers. Well, he does. If you speak in tongues, that is the way that he guides. He's the one who gives them utterance. Amen. That's Acts 2, 4. They spake, what? In foreign languages, in other tongues, they spake as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. Amen. He does give you utterance. It is spiritual prayer. You can call it any of those things as long as at the end of the day, you make sure that you say it's speaking in tongues. And that's what people want to avoid. 
You can call it being spiritual or praying spiritually or with the Holy Spirit's help or in the Holy Spirit or through the Holy Spirit. That's all true. All of the above are true. As long as you say at the very bottom of the page, I'm speaking in tongues or I spoke in tongues or he said to speak in tongues or pray in tongues here. I mean, I've got a verse, 1 Corinthians 14, 2, that, that links this business of tongues with this business of spirit in the spirit or by the spirit, small or capital, however you have it. Then later in this chapter, verse um, 13, Wherefore, let him that speaketh in a tongue pray that he may interpret, for if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prayeth. Couldn't be any clearer. Ephesians 6, 18, however you have it, small or capital, I think it's both, is speaking in tongues. If I pray in a tongue, unknown is not in the original. It's just unknown to the KJV translators, as I've said so often before. If I pray in a tongue, my spirit prayeth. The spirit of the man is that which is praying, not the mind, i.e. the intellect. If I pray in a tongue, my spirit prayeth. But my understanding is unfruitful. So what is it then? Well, I'll do both because he recognizes that they're both in the will of God and both are beneficial for the believer. I will pray with the spirit and I will pray with the understanding. Now, earlier it was in, in verse 2, and now it's with. So don't get hung up on prepositions here. It's in and with and through and by and of and from. It's all of those prepositions. I will pray with the spirit and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. I mean, it couldn't be any plainer or clearer that he's differentiating or setting apart, contrasting praying in tongues as in the Spirit versus that in a known language that you've learned yourself. That would come from the intellect. Couldn't be any clearer than 1 Corinthians 14, 15, that the two are distinct and separate, that you can't pray with your intellect in the spirit that you can't pray with your understanding you know as any baptist or lutheran or methodist would pray that you can't pray with your understanding in the spirit he's setting those two as opposites as contrasts he's separating those from one another you either pray with your understanding or you don't you either pray with the spirit or you don't with the spirit in the spirit which is in tongues now, if you also will turn over to Romans chapter 8, verses 26 and 27. See, we need all these three passages together. Ephesians 6 leaves us with that spirit, and we don't know, is it capital or small? Well, you get small in 1 Corinthians 14, but you get capital in Romans 8. So I'm sure we're to understand both of them. The Holy Spirit is the one who gives us the ability to pray in or with or by our spirit in a foreign language. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities or our weaknesses, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he, this isn't an it like it's your spirit, it's he that searcheth the hearts, knoweth what is the mind of the spirit, because he, not an it like your spirit, that part of you, he maketh intercession for the saints. That's the same word Paul uses in Ephesians 6, 18, the saints, according to the will of God. According to the will of God. God wants us to know that this is a part of our warfare against Satan. That's what all of Ephesians 6, 10 to 18 is set up to discuss. He talks about wrestling against these demonic, satanic powers. We're not wrestling against flesh and blood. That's in verses 10, 11, and 12, and 13, but especially verse 12. I'm back in Ephesians chapter 6. He wants us to know this is a part of our spiritual warfare, and these are part of our weapons uh, that God has given to it. Now, the same thing is not only true in our prayers for one another, and they are very effective, and we need to remember that. 
But it's also true in our own life, and it could be true if you're praying for someone else in their life, even in this whole ballpark of the message of faith that we're talking about. Now, one of the first things that you run across or you find or you think of on your own in this um, study of faith or in the faith walk is, well, now, if I'm believing for something and I've asked the Lord for something, well, well where does prayer enter into all of this? Because I wouldn't want to be praying a repetitious prayer. I wouldn't want to be vain or like the heathen in my prayers. I wouldn't want to, in the second and third and fourth and fifth time I pray, to thereby be denying the fact that I believe God heard me the first time that I prayed. And so where does prayer enter into it all? Well, it enters in somewhere. Paul wouldn't have it included over there in Ephesians chapter 6. And it, it wouldn't be included elsewhere in the Bible. And so I guess one of the first things that comes across someone's mind is, is the thought, well, now if I believe that God is who he is, who the Bible describes him to be, that he's sovereign, that he rules through all of the events of history by his own mighty power, that he knows the end from the beginning, better than that, he's determined the end from the beginning, he knows what's going to come to pass, he's determined with his own determinate counsel, the things that are brought to pass, then why pray? Where would prayer ever enter into this? Well, the theologians think they have some answers. They're not really for sure. But I find it interesting that Paul just never bothered himself with such vain intellectual pursuits as to uh, trying to uh, somehow relate or draw together the sovereignty of God, the absolute sovereignty of God, and the call for the Christian to pray. He never speculated on that. He never followed the vain intellectual pursuit of trying to unite or qualify or clarify. He just knew that the same God who said, I'm sovereign, said, pray. Ask for your daily needs. Pray that you won't fall into temptation. Pray that you'll be delivered from evil. Pray, intercede with all prayer and supplication for all the saints. Well, now, if God is simply going to bless his people or not, he's going to reward them or not, he's going to keep them from Satan's power, or his clutches, or he isn't, then why pray about it? Paul never followed such vain speculations. Theologians have recognized, have thought that they have seen uh, a problem here. How can you have sovereignty and prayer in the Christian life at the same time? Paul, the theologian of sovereignty, if there ever was one, never flinched from writing passages like Ephesians 6.18. If there was ever a, a theologian of sovereignty, a theologian of, of greats, a theologian of God's uh, determinate counsel, it's the Apostle Paul. He's the one writing all of these books in the New Testament. Never flinched from writing those verses. Never paused to clarify or qualify. I'm sure never paused in his own life to say, well, now what about or how can... It be, what if? Those are vain intellectual pursuits. He knew that the Spirit is working through me, impressing me to say this, to write this, or in his own life, the Spirit of God is working through me, impressing me to pray. And he didn't pause and say, now, but how can this be? If God has determined something, it's going to come to pass or it's not. God knows that he's determined it. He's already set into motion the very things that will bring it into existence or bring it to pass, you know, then, then why should I pray? You know, what's prayer all about then? Well, I know that some people say, well, God has ordained, and this is basically true, God, but it's an intellectual pursuit, though. God has ordained not only the ends, but the means to the ends. The ends are the fact that the elect are going to find out, they're going to discover their election before it's too late. The elect are. No one else will because there's nothing to discover for them. The elect will discover their election. It'll be revealed to them, of course. They'll find out about their election before it's too late. But does that mean we shouldn't preach the gospel? Maybe they're going to find out about their election through the belief of the gospel that we preach. God's people, his blessings that are due them are going to come to them and not be thwarted. Because God has determined that from all eternity. That the blessings due God's people are going to come. They won't be thwarted. But Paul still says intercede and pray. 
with all prayer and with all supplications. I would say that this business of Ephesians 6, 18 actually probably shows a strong faith. It's a faith that's so confident that what it has received, has, what it has prayed for, it has received, so confident of that, that it is excited about, enthusiastic about. It gets on the ball praying and interceding on behalf of that. I suppose that a lack of faith could also lead to a lot of praying, but a lack of faith would lead to the sort of vain, repetitious prayer of desperation that the prayer of faith that was originally prayed never leads to. That type of prayer, Mark eleven twenty four, what things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. That type of faith which is relief, that type of prayer which is prayed, never leads to the sort of vain, repetitious prayers of desperation, that a lack of faith and a lack of um, a biblical belief and trust in God will surely lead to. You're aware of the fact that some people pray, ask God to do something or ask him for something, and they are uh, hardly through praying that prayer, then they're asking him to do the same thing again, praying and praying and praying to do the same thing. That's not Bible. God never said to do that. He said when you, when you pray, not whenever anything changes, or he said when you pray. He dates the whole business of it all, and it's not when something happens or later. It's always when you pray. Believe that you shall receive, and you will. Believe that you have received, and you shall. Believe that you have received, and you have. Paul is aware of all of that. Paul teaches the same thing himself. But then he goes on to say, and intercede, and intercede. I think maybe the best illustration we have of this, not in the New Testament, it's back in the Old. And it's back in the book of Daniel, in chapter 10 of the book of Daniel, where Daniel had certain unchanging promises which God had given, setting in motion many, many years in advance through prophecies and then through his own workings in history, the captivity and the final release and deliverance of his people from Babylon. And the prophet Daniel, being in Babylon, recognizes this in chapter 9, the first few verses. He realizes that the period of the prophets is now over. They had said, Jeremiah for one, in Jeremiah 25, you'll be there, not two, as Hananiah said, but 70, 70, 70 long years. 70 years you'll be in Babylon. He recognizes that time is through. He's seen that through the books, we, we're told in the first few verses of chapter 9. And he doesn't, however, take it for granted. He begins to intercede, and he begins to pray. Daniel wasn't called up, as some Christians are, some theologians are, with this vain intellectual pursuit, or really it's not so much a pursuit, it really ends up with simply a refusal to pray uh, because we think God has already determined everything is going to come to pass and there's no need to intercede, there's no need to pray for that. Daniel knew better than that. Daniel didn't try to get into explanations of it all. He had in his own hands the book that said 70 years and he had a calendar that said they're over. And he didn't say, well, what will be will be. Hyper-Calvinism, I'm a pre-Calvinist, hyper-Calvinist, what will be will be. He had the prophecy 70 years. He had his own calendar that said it's over with. And he said, but I'm not through with this matter. I'm going to intercede on behalf of God's people that God will do what he said that he will do. That pleases God. That's not begging and pleading. That pleases God. You're simply pointing out to him, now here's what you've said that you will do. And what furthermore it is, it's a recognition that we're not just dealing, and here's the most serious thing we need to remember. We're not just dealing in a, in a closed universe, a closed system that's a good universe, that's a good system. We're not dealing with purely a situation that's between you and God. We're dealing with a situation of a very wicked and evil universe where there's something between you and God. 
there's something between you and God in your prayers. There's something between God and you in his answers and his responses. Now, if we were dealing in some uh, utopian type situation where there is no power of darkness, well, no sense in talking about that. We're not. We're dealing with a different situation. There is the force that is against us praying in faith, releasing our faith to receive from God, and at the same time against God ever being able to break through and manifest these answers. So you see, Daniel, Paul, and others are taking more things into consideration than this, uh, this purely intellectual, a uh, uh, philosophical approach to all of it. Well, now, if... A plus B equals C, then that means that B plus A equals C, and C minus B equals A. He wasn't caught up in all that. There's something that's real, that's, that's in the world. The power of darkness. That doesn't thwart faith. That doesn't change the message of faith. It doesn't change anything at all. But it adds to what we already know. God has said, what I've said I'll do when you believe me, that it's done, it's done for you, and it shall be, and it shall be manifested. Amen. And so Daniel has all of this, but Daniel doesn't sit down on that, though. He knows, now God has said it, I believed it. You're going to have to listen this evening with your heart and not your mind. Daniel knows God said it, I believe it, or whether I do or don't, God said it's going to come to pass. He said 70 years. Now, what if we've got 75 years, or 82, or 115 God would be a liar. Jeremiah would be proven to be a false prophet then. Because he himself said concerning Hananiah's prophecy, two years, well, let's just wait and see. So you wait through two years and they're not back. Someone says cynically, Jeremiah said seven years, let's wait and see. Jeremiah's dead and gone. Daniel's on the scene and Daniel notices it's 84, not 70. Well, now that makes Jeremiah a false prophet. We know he's not false. God has given his word, Daniel's believing it, and that's not the end of the story. Amen. See, that is the story. That's not the end of the story. Amen. God has given his promise that I'll do it. Whatever you ask in my name, I'll do it. And so a believer asks in his name. That's not the end of the story. Amen. Praying with all prayer and supplication with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints, for ourselves included. We'll see in Daniel 10, Daniel held on and pressed through. So many times people don't realize how potentially important, maybe even historic their prayers are God is not a man he never forgets anything he hasn't forgotten although you have a prayer that you've ever prayed no we're not talking about some old wishful hopeful thing I mean any time you've ever asked him through his son in faith for anything he's never forgotten that You know how we go along, we pray for something, and then a couple of years later, something we haven't gotten, and we kind of think, well, I guess I better wise up on myself now. I shouldn't have been so foolish and so radical as to, and then we just kind of, you know, give that notion up, and, and so we just cut right off any opportunity for God to, to come through for us in that area and do what we had said that he was going to do or believing that he was doing a long time ago. God hasn't forgotten he won't do it if we stop believing. He won't do it if we just surrender and don't give him any opportunity. God hasn't forgotten. Sometimes it appears like he has. God hasn't forgotten, though. Had he forgotten the children of Israel down in Egypt? Not after 400 years. He hadn't forgotten them. Many generations had been born and died, but God hadn't forgotten he has a day, and one day, one day, lo and behold, a man is walking in the desert, and a, he sees a bush on fire that's not consumed. God said, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I've not forgotten my promises to them. 
Who would have ever expected that day, that way, that man? God doesn't forget. I remember the promises that I made to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I've heard the groaning of my people, and I've come down to deliver them. Why not? Faith doesn't ask, ask questions of why. It just believes. It doesn't say why me or why then or why now or why. It just believes. It doesn't ask why. That's a confession of and a question of gross ignorance and unbelief to say why. God has told you the answers to all the whys. That's just God is God. Let him work things out his own way. And on your part, you stay standing and believing and you let him work out things in his own time and his own way. We might as well not try because we won't be successful to ever force God's hand at anything. He's going to do it in his own way, in his own timing. Who would ever expected Moses, the desert, a bush, 400 years? Why not four, 40, 400 years? God never forgets. I'm sure there are people in Babylon. God has forgotten. God doesn't forget. God always remembers what he has said that he will do. The scriptures tell us God is not a man that he can lie to us. He's not the son of man that he can change his ways on us. If he said it, he'll do it. If he's spoken it, he'll make it good. He's a faithful God. His word is forever established and settled in heaven. Amen. It needs to be forever settled in our heart. It's settled in heaven. Whether it's settled in our heart is a personal matter there. We have to say to him about whatever it is we're believing, your word's not only settled forever, Lord, in, in heaven, but in my heart. It's settled. Because God is, he cannot lie. He's faithful. He's true. Oh, what things God will do for us, what things he must have in store for us if we'll believe him and exercise our faith and extend ourselves and put ourselves out where we, we're just dependent on him. We have to trust him. There aren't any other answers or helps or hopes around. Surely he will bless us greatly when we do that. Things that we haven't even dreamed of yet or maybe things that we have we were afraid to dream of again. Amen. We dreamed of them, but we were afraid to ask. I'm always reminded of that song because of all the things you have to do in the world. It will only last if it's eternal. It will only last if it's eternal. So much that we do is all in the name of vanity. Oh, well, I don't want to say too much because it could be easily misinterpreted along that line. But I know that God has a plan for everyone's life in this church, for every single person here. He has a plan for your life that's fitted and molded just for you and just for your life. And it may include more than just what your old run-of-the-mill thoughts are. He may have greater things. I mean, Moses never, I'm sure thought back in his early days that he's going to be a deliverer for the whole nation. Well, he was growing up being taught the best of the ways of the world around him. And one day a revelation came to him in his heart that you're going to be the deliverer. And he got a little ahead of the schedule and 40 years later, it was God's timing. He thought he'd do it by his own might and power with his own understanding and weapons. And he murdered a man. He was way ahead of God's schedule by 40 years. I'm sure in his early days it never came into his heart as it did later. Stephen tells us that in Acts 7 what God was going to do through him. Well, Daniel 10 in verse 1, in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel whose name was called Belteshazzar. The thing was true, but the time appointed was long, and he understood the thing and had an understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. Now he goes into first person here. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all until three whole weeks were fulfilled. And in the four and twentieth day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is Hiddekel, then I lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, 
whose loins were girded with fine gold of Euphaz. His body also was like the barrel, and his face as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like in color to polished brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. Does that remind you of John's vision in Revelation 1? And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them, so that they fled to hide themselves. Therefore I was left alone and saw this great vision, and there remained no strength in me. For my comeliness was turned in me into corruption, and I retained no strength. Yet heard I the voice of his words, and when I heard the voice of his words, then was I in a deep sleep on my face, and my face toward the ground. Behold, an hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. So you picture Daniel having, first of all, been upon his face, and now he's like a beast on all four, crouching on his knees and on the palms of his hands. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright. For unto thee am I now sent. When he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God. For the continuance.